pleased to announce our next speaker, Darío Luis Benagas. Darío is a lecturer in the in the TISO in TISO at the University of Strathclyde and is an associate fellow with the University of Warwick. He is involved in teacher education programs and various educational initiatives with teenage learners in Argentina. His main interests are CLIL, action research, and social justice in language education. During Dario's talk, we recommend watching in speaker view, and if you have any questions, please type them in, in the Q&A box. Take away, share your screen, Dario. Well, thank you very much indeed, Maria Jesus. It's nice to see you around. Uh, <laughs> so let me share my screen in full. That I suppose, right? Um, okay, well, hello everyone. Thank you very much indeed again for uh, this presentation. Can you see my screen? Can you all see it? Okay. Um, so the, uh, lovely, perfect, thanks. So the, uh, without further ado, the, um, the focus is on uh, supporting novice teachers in the enactment of language teaching pedagogies that are inclusive and that look at gender diversity and gender equality and gender equity in education. So um, two key constructs here will be, um, you know, comprehensive sexuality education, but then I will be looking at the experience itself, voices from the teachers and from the students involved, and a few takeaways um, that we may want to consider, I suppose. Um, when we go back tomorrow <laughs> to our practice. And as I said before, two key concepts that inform this experience are comprehensive sexuality education and a gender perspective in ELT. So what do we mean by these two terms? When we talk about comprehensive sexuality education, <clears throat> In this case, this is UNESCO 2008. We might see it as a curriculum based process of teaching and learning about the cognitive, emotional, physical, and social aspects of sexuality. So, this is important here because it's not just a biological view, let's say, of um, sexuality, it's all these dimensions. It aims to equip children and young people with knowledge, skills, attitudes and values that will empower them to realize their health, well-being and dignity, develop respectful social and sexual relationships, consider how their choices affect their own well-being and that of others, and understand and ensure the protection of their rights throughout their lives. So this is a general view, but in the case of Argentina, comprehensive sexuality education has um, a stronger dimension because there's a law that, in a nutshell, right? Uh, the law says that comprehensive sexuality education needs to run across um, the curriculum. So it's need, uh, it needs to be addressed, it needs to be present in all um, levels of education. So. In the case of Argentina, when we talk about comprehensive sexuality education, according to the law, we've got these two major central aims. The first one, to guarantee the citizen's right to equality in all aspects of social life, regardless of their gender or sexual orientation. So this is why I, um, I see comprehensive sexuality education as part of my interest in social justice, because you know, it's education for everyone and educational experiences where everyone feels represented equally. And to address issues such as consent, consent, sorry, heteronormativity, um, patriarchal practices, gender violence, identity and relationships, 
physical and emotional well-being, human rights, gender equality, and sexual harassment. So of course it deals with um, issues that relate to, for example, bullying and gender violence, domestic abuse, but it also touches upon um, gender and sexuality as culturally constructed um, concepts that of course can be deconstructed, can be challenged and can be um, looked through a wider, uh, more diverse uh, lens as it were. Now, if we link this notion of comprehensive sexuality education to the concept of gender diversity and gender perspective, in fact, so this is what the gender perspective does. Um, it examines how gender, sexuality, and gender inequality and equity impacts on people's roles, opportunities, and access to resources. And the important thing here is that when we talk about the gender perspective, um, experts and people in the field, you know, in, in practice, will say that the first thing to talk about, or when we want to promote gender equality, the first thing we need to do is we need to acknowledge gender inequality, because this is why we have this such a strong um, orientation towards equality, because we, we want to um, defend everyone's rights and we are fighting for something that's not, unfortunately, of course, that's not systemically present across all our social practices, that is to say se um, gender and sexual equality and diversity. So what a gender perspective does is it helps us see everything, see education in this particular case and language education through the lens of gender and sexuality and how these two terms, how these two concepts have an impact on our roles and aspirations and the way we construct our identity, our own identity, but also how we construct it in relation to others. So, um, of course, this is not something that we do explicitly, but primarily this should be systemically ingrained in our teaching. So it's not that, well, next week we're gonna have a lesson about women um, you know, famous women in the country, and then I just check that box and I carry on with whatever I was doing. But it's more about, you know, the hidden curriculum, looking at what happens in a course book, look, looking at what happens in terms of feedback and other aspects um, in, uh, in social practice. And the law is for all education in the country. So the law applies to private and state institutions. And um, the law also includes topics and the way they need to be addressed. So it's not a matter of saying, well, here are the topics, you deal with them the way you wish, the way you want. In paper, um, no matter whether it's a religious school, let's say, um, or a state school, everyone's got to comply with the law, with, as we, <laughs> That's what happens, which, which should happen with um, any law anyways. Now, the, the experience itself, so that was, you know, a brief intro to it. Um, before moving to Glasgow, I used to be a teacher educator in southern Argentina in, um, with pre-service um, teachers. So um, they had, by law, they had a module in their teacher education program, they had a module, mandatory module on comprehensive sexuality education. And they wanted to, not just because there's a law, but they wanted to include a gender perspective in their teaching because it's about human rights and it's about guaranteeing everyone's rights to representation and equality. And one drawback, the program had was they had the subject, so it was like formally presented there, but unfortunately we were not successful at, at making links between that module and the rest of the modules in the program, particularly those modules that deal with um, 
English language methodology and, uh, and teaching. Right? Um, so that was what prompted these four novice EFL teachers to approach me because I had started to um, do some research and pedagogical experiences uh, with fellow teachers um, to find ways in which they could combine comprehensive sexuality education in ELT or a gender perspective in ELT, but in my case, through CLIL as an approach, content and language integrated learning, as an approach that would be um, helpful for teachers um, to include a gender perspective or topics linked to comprehensive sexuality education. So this, of course, as you can see here, raised tensions between teacher preparation and practice. That is to say, the law was um, very clear about what had to be done, right? But in practice, the curriculum, the teacher education curriculum, I mean, uh, was sort of lagging behind. So of course, teachers were getting um, qualified to teach English, but they felt that they had this gap, let's say, in their in their preparation because they they had like say the formal content about comprehensive sexuality education and gen and a gender perspective but they didn't know how to make that pedagogically possible systematically speaking in their own teaching and um the discussions could be of course endless with the teachers uh but of course you know they had to to work on uh, on something in particular. Now, we got together and I said to them, these are four teachers, and said before, I said, well, you know, um, what if we do this? And this is what we did. We plan and delivered, well, they plan, we plan and they delivered um, comprehensive sexuality education oriented lessons. So they were still teaching English mm, in um, secondary schools, state secondary schools in Argentina, and the level of English of these students was about maybe like A2, B1, if we think about the common European framework. So, for example, in some cases, the discussions could be in English and or Spanish, but the focus was still English. So here, and this is an important um, aspect to, to mention, here these teachers were not say explicitly teaching comprehensive sexuality um, education content, let's say, but they were using it as a means to teach English. So that normalizes the topic. Otherwise it feels like, well, today we're going to talk about something, I don't know, uh, special, gay families. And that's not the idea of comprehensive sexuality education. You want to normalize it, let's say, and you want to include it in the same way that you would want to talk about other issues, um, other topics. And this experience extended over four months. And with this group of teachers, these four teachers, I had monthly meetings because of course they were busy, I was busy. This, um, this experience emerged out of their interests and I just responded to, to those interests, but it wasn't part of our, uh, let's say, job and job profile. And um, together with the meetings, there were classroom observations, so they would observe each other just to gain a better understanding of how they would plan and deliver those comprehensive sexuality education oriented lessons. And then I also wanted to take a look at what happened in practice. And um, together with our meetings and discussions, we also interviewed the students. But mind you, this is not a piece of, let's say, formal research, like action research or exploratory practice. We just wanted to get feedback from the students. But here the focus was very much on practice. So maybe it sounds like too formal now, but this was extremely practical, extremely hands-on because we wanted to you know, address all these issues. And in terms of resources, when the teachers planned their lessons, they either adapted 
or created flyers, adverts, pictures, memes, infographics, tweets, short articles, and videos. So they had a mixture of either authentic materials that would match the level of English the students had, or they could perhaps take an authentic source of input and perhaps modify it to make it comprehensible enough. Of course, you know, a little bit above the student's level to add a linguistic challenge, but they wanted it to be um, meaningful and rich without sacrificing the complexity of the, tongue, of, the, of the content of the topic. And here, this is important, um, Spanish was, Spanish is uh, usually the L1 in Argentina, um, Spanish was accepted as another tool within the classroom. So for example, it was fine for maybe students to make a comment uh, in Spanish, but then the teacher would take that comment on board and you know, respond in English or take that as an opportunity to focus on something in particular. But um, this is important. Spanish was another tool within the classroom. It wasn't just, you know, in English, in English, that obsession with English, because then that would sort of hinder participation and would demotivate learners to say wonderful things as usual. They, uh, they wanted to say, they wanted to share. Um, and what we did in terms of materials and the lesson plans, what we agreed on was, well, we had this very um, simple shared folder on Google. So everyone had access to it. So there we would, um, you know, we would populate different folders and then we say, you know, this is wonderful. This is a great picture that we might want to use for this and that. And the topic, of course, would be linked to what we already had in the curriculum in terms of the linguistic topics I was supposed to teach. And the table looked pretty much like this, you know, a resource, for example, a video, the topic, stories, you know, this is, this was an idea saying, you know, we can use this video to talk about stories, function and structure. So grammar was ingrained here, in this case, narrating, reported speech, and thinking skills, in this case, reflecting. So this was a table that we all contributed to. And for example, in this case, the, uh, just let me know if you can see the, um, maybe you can't listen, but that's all right. So the link would take you to um, a video of um, colleague, Griselda Beacon telling a story based on the family book by Todd Parr. And um, that was a resource that we used in, in teaching, okay? And that was something that the teachers found extremely, extremely um, helpful. Now, this, as I said before, went on for four months. And this is what one of the teachers said towards the end of the experience. It's not something I'm used to doing. We usually follow a course book. So one of the things that the experience left us was this notion of teachers as creators of their own materials around topics that were meaningful. And in a way, empowering teachers to address topics through their own materials. And then another colleague said, until now, I've tried to avoid topics that might be like opening a can of worms. I've played it too safe because of course, sometimes you feel that um, you don't want to talk about gender, you don't want to talk about sexuality because those are, um, you might say, sensitive topics. But that's exactly the, the aim of um, the law, to talk about such topics. Otherwise, you're always hiding them and by talking about them, we have helped, or teachers have helped learners talk about their problems or maybe um, channel situations of domestic abuse or talk about their own identities. So this has become space where students talk about issues around comprehensive sexuality education without feeling 
guilty about talking about topics, you know, that are central to human existence. We are all gendered beings after all. And Felipe, another teacher said, it takes time to learn about the topic and then prepare the lesson. But again, this is something that happens with any topic that we want to teach, it requires preparation. The materials need to be tailored. It's like creating a bespoke course. So that was you know, the beauty of creating your own materials. But at the same time, of course, this is time consuming because you've got to create from scratch. But on the other hand, and this is what happened with this um, shared folder, at the end of the four months, the four teachers had created an amazing bank of materials, lesson plans, but also the resources themselves that could be re uh, reused in different ways. So um, in terms of reflective practice, as we said before, this is again something important that another teacher said. I think it has helped me realize that it's important to focus on linguistic functions, meanings and topics and be less obsessed with grammar or a grammar-driven curriculum. So it wasn't just grammar focusing on form, but this notion of functions, meanings, and topics. So that grammar is still in, in place, is still part of the curriculum, but you give it meaning, and the meaning is linked to what students are interested in, present topics, and the law. Students, here I've got two students' um, comments. Tamara said, it's probably the first time that I've seen a teacher of English who prepares the lessons on topics that matter, on topics which are pressing and close to us. And this was quite an eye-opener, let's say, um, because the... Um, This is the way that the students were looking at uh, my colleagues, at teachers, you know, teachers who only use a course book. And in terms of resources, uh, Gala, another student, another teenage student said, before we would do grammar and read some very short artificial and uninteresting texts. Now we watch videos, read long texts, analyze visuals, it's more demanding, but I like it, even if I struggle a bit. So the students, like in this case, Gala, they could see the challenge, but it was, a mo but it was motivating that challenge because they knew the topic was interested and therefore they felt motivated to invest and develop their English uh, language skills. So a few takeaways from here. In the first case, the experience helped my colleagues develop agency as you know, teachers that could change their practices, that could um, look at ways in which those practices could be um, enriched and oriented towards a gender perspective. In the case of context, the teaching became contextualized in local topics, in local practices, in contrast to what a course book would do, where for reasons we all know, um, the topics will be very uh, general and bland sometimes. Then engagement, that was another um, beautiful aspect that emerged, um, participation, so not just students paying attention, but also participating actively, whether it was in English or Spanish. And over the, uh, as classes went by, their participation began to be more in English with the language they were learning, um, embedded in the topic and the linguistic focus. And in terms of gender, the students and the teachers, um, you know, we all became more aware of how to address gender how to think about our own genders and our own identities and, uh, and the way we um, talk about gender in our daily practices, not just within the context of formal education, but outside school. And that helped us 
um, become more reflective and reflect on the power of language to encode um, and sometimes, unfortunately, to label people with um, labels they don't like or they don't feel they're accurate or representative enough. So this is, in a nutshell, um, the experience. Um, thank you and uh, thank you the, uh, the organizers. So I think, do we have time for, for questions now? Uh, yes, we have four more minutes. Lovely. Thank you very much, Daria, for this great uh, awesome. presentation. So uh, we have four minutes in the Q&A um, okay. box. You can find the questions. So I've got, um, so I did answer the first one. So it was for all schools, private, state schools, no one escapes from it, from the law. Um, someone else says, do you think it would be better also if course books address this? Absolutely, absolutely. And as far as I know, there's one course book raised up and the authors do touch upon um, topics that have a gender perspective, let's say, in ELT. And they talk about different, um, different aspects of, that are linked to sexuality education. But that's the course book I know of. I'm sure there are other materials, but I haven't seen anything of this sort with the mainstream publishers. Um, and of course, we would like to have that um, level of representation. And Natalia says, have you put this in practice in a bilingual school? How much English time students have per week? Well, as I said, maybe at the beginning, this experience was carried out in a secondary school, state school, public school in Argentina where teachers, just, sorry, not the teachers, the students have um, two hours a week of English. So it's not much, um, but you do with, you know, we, we may do. And, uh, and that was the experience. At the same time, I know that um, this, the drive for a gender perspective has been implemented in bilingual schools, but personally, I don't have any specific um, details about how this has been implemented. But um, if you check the latest issue of the Argentinian Journal of Applied Linguistics, you will find an article by Silvana Aciardo, Acardo, 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 Acardo and she has written about um, experiences. I can't remember now whether, whether they are in, um, in private or uh, bilingual schools, but there are very practical research informed whose experiences about how this has been or could be carried out um, in different contexts. And even in the context of a pandemic when we are all teaching uh, online. So that's, that's that, I think. I think I have covered. Oh, sorry, there was another one. How do you approach students who show discomfort or unease when topics like gender diversity are discussed in class? Um, it didn't happen to us, but um, what we, because I'm going to tell you what happens to me and, uh, you know, based on, on experience and, and uh, what happened uh, with my colleagues, but they did have, I mean, the students, the, the chance to come up to us in private or send us a message or speak to someone else to say, you know, I don't feel comfortable with these topics. And again, it was a matter of respect with any topic we teach. That is to say, we never force students to talk or to answer a question, right? So that was the same rule being applied here. If I ask you, let's say, kind of an innocent question about anything and you don't want to answer it, that's fine. You know, if my question is, you know, what did you do over the weekend and you don't feel like answering it, then it's fine. And the same thing was applied here, respecting people's uh, right not to answer a question. But of course, um, this could open up as one of the, uh, one of the quotes said, a can of worms. Um, 
But the moment there's a student who expresses discomfort, we talk about it, not perhaps in class, but if the students want, or, 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 the, or if a student wants, we can talk about it, we can discuss the topic, because maybe that discomfort may be linked to something that's happening to the student at home, or maybe that the student is being bullied because of um, aspects and dimensions of their identity. So again, that becomes a space to uh, address the issues, not to hide it. Uh, somebody said, well, you know, it's, it's all right, it's not my, 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 my problem. Um, and that's exactly the aim of the law, at least in the context of, of Argentina. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Darío, uh, for this talk. Uh, this obviously addresses very relevant issues that uh, we tend to avoid, and the literature, actually, just as you said, the textbooks uh, do not address. So this uh, could give us a great sense of the relevance that these could have inside the classroom, taking the time to address these issues with and these points of usuality, as we were using uh, yeah, oh, usualized think, yesterday. Uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I see Silvana Acardo here, so um, I'm sure she'll be able to answer more questions because she's the one who authored this article that I'm referring uh, to.